Do you ever feel like Dennis Pratt? Never. No, I never do. I'm quite startled when I'm called by my real name. But that's because, you see, I've had my artificial name for nearly 60 years. Did you feel differently when you were Quentin Crisp than before when you were Dennis Pratt? And I mean, did possibly that... a little, possibly I'm feeling that this is um, exciting, this is my new self. So you, you start a bestowed a freedom of a it sort. It does. To... Everybody should at least consider changing his name so as not to get stuck with a name which perhaps he doesn't like or represent something terrible like his parents mm. or something like that. And he should have the opportunity to start all over again. This is a collection of Quentin Crisp. Tell me, what do you think of when you think of Quentin Crisp? Well, you know, he was my uncle, so I, you know, I have family recollections of him, but he was a, an amazing person because he always um, stood up for his own principles in spite of everything. And he was a very talented, clever man. He was an artist, he was a writer and a raconteur. To me, I associate him with a period in the 70s when he made, when a film was made of this book, The Naked Civil Servant, for which he's very well known. Yes. And inside, he's inscribed it to you. Yeah. And up here, we've got this lovely etching of him in a characteristic pose, I think. Something of a dandy, wasn't Absolutely, he? Absolutely, yes. Um, and very precise about the way he wanted to present himself oh, as well. Oh, yes, yes. Lovely, lovely detail on this. That was in Mummy's house, yeah? Yeah. In Ridgewood. That's yes. Oh, that I took... Uh, we up went on the heights. Up on the heights. I remember that. I was very proud of that picture, actually. That's at the wedding. The wedding, Francis. Quentin Crisp was my great uncle. He was my grandfather's brother, my mother's uncle. The flower girl, Amy O'Connor, junior usher, Adrian Poinkledea. Since all my grandparents died before I was born, or when I was very little, Quentin was the closest thing I had to a grandfather. Throughout my life, I saw Quentin at various family events. Birthdays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, weddings, graduations, and christenings. But weddings were probably the most ironic. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, for the very first time, I'd like to announce the bride and groom, Mr. and Mrs. James Crawford. <laughs> But you see, Quentin didn't believe in marriage. He used to say, marriage is for a little while. It's alimony that is forever. What do you want us to look like? What's that one? What do you want us to look like? Us? Like us. Oh, what natural. do you want us to look like? We can't manage that. <laughs> Try something else. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty levels that we Half the time I felt that he, uh, it wasn't in his persona. He had made this style of person. Like, right. Uh, he's all alone in the world and he has his style and his thing. And so it was like, uh, you know, and if you had a family, it kind of spoilt that image. Mm -hmm. That's the wedding. That's a, your wedding, Adrian? Yeah, that's my wedding. Who's that good-looking guy there? That's Matt Finale. Remember him? Oh, I remember. I just so... remember that at your wedding, I felt so badly because he was sitting, like, at the wrong table, remember? Yeah, I, don't, I was noticing that from the video. I don't know what happened, why he ended up at that table. We, we were very concerned, concerned. We, were we, very, we kept uh, going over there and visiting. We don't know why he was there. Why did Quentin get the bad table? Not that it was a bad table, but why was he not seated with the rest of my family at my wedding? I don't understand how that happened. I mean, 
Maybe we didn't have a clear seating plan. But, yeah, I feel bad about it. I suppose it compounds with the fact that after he died, when I went to clear out his flat with Philip Ward, Philip told me that Quentin had mentioned to him that he was disappointed not to have received a thank you card for his gift. We didn't really send anyone thank you cards, and I did thank him in person. I suppose I thought that someone as unconventional as Quentin wouldn't really need a thank you card. But I guess I was wrong. And of course, if I had thought about it more, it would have made sense, really, given his interest in manners and etiquette. I guess that just because you're radical in some ways doesn't mean you're radical in all ways. Quentin had three brothers and sisters, Gerald, Lewis, and Phyllis. Gerald and Lewis both left the country during the Depression in search of work elsewhere. Lewis ended up in South America working for a telecommunications company. He had two daughters, Denise, named after Dennis, and Elaine, my mother. Having grown up all her life in South America, my mother had never met her grandmother, Quentin's mother, until she was 18 when she decided to go on a trip to meet her before she died. And so I asked Marietta to come with me, and she said yes. And we traveled by plane to New York, and then from New York to England. We went on either the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth, I can't remember which, and was freezing cold, and it was for Christmas. And that was quite daring in those days, because nobody ever did those kind of things, like 18, Two girls. That's and you. Me and Baba. This was the first time I ever met Baba. That's the first time I met Quentin, but not on that day, that particular day. I wasn't so scared of him that time. The first time it was when um, Auntie Phil said, uh, "You'll be coming on the 422 train or something." And you'll probably uh, come, be coming with Quentin on the same one. And I said, well, how would I know him? You know, how would I? I said, so, well, you can't miss him. Mm -hmm. And it was true. And when we saw him, Marietta and I were terrified. And we, like, hid you know, because he was so flamboyant. You right. Know? And we were so South American, like, so conservative and, and you know. Mm -hmm. we, we'd never seen anybody like that in our lives. Hello? Hello, Francis. Yes? Hi, Francis. It's Adrian. Oh, hi, Adrian. How are you? Okay. I'm all you right. Okay now? Do you have a minute to talk about Quentin now? I could record a conversation just, you know, I have a few questions. Oh, okay. Um, when you were growing up, you saw Quentin quite a lot, didn't you? Oh, I saw him quite a lot, particularly when I was working in London at the beginning of the, in the 1950s. I always used to go and visit him on a Saturday after I finished work, and I used to have lunch with him at what was called the barbecue, the, the cafe on the King's Road, Chelsea, and I used to meet um, quite a few of his friends there, and it was always a you know, great time. Mm -hmm. you know, and they were always surprised when he, I used to go out um, on Saturdays with him that he had a niece, he they always used to... We used to say, oh, this is my niece who comes from the real world. <laughs> when I got married, I sent him an invitation to the wedding, and he said, I've been to a few family funerals, but I do draw the line at weddings. What about his name change? He changed his name when he was quite young, well, didn't he? I mean, he started going by Quentin when he was in his 20s or something. He, he changed it to Quentin, I think, when he was in his 20s, but we never called him Quentin, ever. Um, only I started to call him Quentin when he went to New York and everybody else called him Quentin, so I had to. But at home, um, he was always called Dennis, Uncle Dennis. And, um, you know, he didn't, uh, only once I remember sending him a letter, a Christmas card or something, and sending it to Dennis Pratt and giving it back saying, not known here. So I thought, oh, I've got to start 
<laughs> my father never spoke, and I don't even remember having ha having a chat with my father. He would say things, and you would reply, but there was no conversation. He never told you what his thoughts were about anything. My mother made fun of him in a mild way, and we learned to do the same. My father never talked to my mother. I never remember a chat, a conversation, an exchange of jokes, anything that is human. He would address or remark to her, and she would reply, and that was all. It was all surface. There was no content. I suppose when I was young, my mother mattered most in my life, and she was always there. She tried to understand me. She alternately defended me from the world and tried to adapt me to it. And this was her difficulty and she couldn't manage it. When I grew up, she regretted having done this and tried to make me tough enough to live in the world. The rows of my father, the hatred of my brother and my sister for me, the weeping and wailing and the carrying on that went on simply because I was gay. When I was once, when I was walking about the street like this, my brother and a girlfriend of his passed me in the street, about that far away, and she said, look at that! And he said, I've seen it before. Well, but that was not in detrimental way. My father spoke like that. He was exactly like that Quentin. That was his humour. That was his humour. Right. He, he was very deadpan, a very, uh, very funny. But he would never laugh. My father never laughed. He just said the funniest things, outrageous things. Everybody else fell down on the floor laughing. Right. And he, he just kept a stiff up a British lip. It's hard for me to know, really, what their relationship was like. Lewis used to write letters to Quentin and address them. Dear sir or madam, cross out that which does not apply. I know he meant that as a joke. I'm just not sure both sides of the correspondence were laughing. What about when the naked civil servant came out? What was your mother's reaction to that? I mean, they... well, my mother's yeah, my Baba, my father, I both died before then, and my mother was horrified. Really, we saw it with her, and she had no idea that he, who thought that he was a male prostitute, really upset her. I think. Um, yeah, she, she really had no idea of uh, what his life was like, so it was a shame, really, I think, that she had to see it, because I think, you know, it spoiled uh, her image of him, which was always someone who stood down and played Scrabble, you know, and, and that sort of thing, but uh, that's what right. it is. Um, I, it wasn't the book that upset my mother, maybe she didn't take it all in the book, it was the film, the television film. Mm. And, of course, she was portrayed in it. Their home life was portrayed, and she kept saying, well, it wasn't like that at all, you know. I think it was that she found it a bit upsetting. Right, right. And, of course, that's also more public, because it was on television. That's right, yes. Yes, after he became famous, so to speak, he became more remote. He, I, I felt that he spoke in cliches. He, um, I remember, because he used to be always very cosy, and... Once he did his one-man show in Bristol, and Peter and I went to the show, and we went out for the meal with him afterwards, and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't talk a normal conversation. He was only sort of talking in, um, I suppose he couldn't get it out of his head, you know, in, in the show, and, you know, things he said. And I thought, oh, dear, we've sort of lost him, really. He's, um, you know, he's gone off into the theatrical world. I now have three nieces, and their attitude towards my notoriety, of course, is vastly different from that of my brothers and sister. My brothers and sister were acutely embarrassed, but my nieces and my great nephews and niece regard the whole thing as a joke. Now that I have great nephews, and they, of course, regard me more or less as part of New York life, they like the notoriety, I think. They can just nip and nimble a bit and go away. They aren't involved in it, and I think they regard it as funny. And it is. My niece and nephew and one of my great-great-nephews recently lunched, and I ate very well. 
The conversation was nice, and we talked about this and that, uh, and of nothing important. My great nephew didn't bring his wife, who is very nice, and so is he. He and his sister get on fine, which is a great relief. So I'm lucky in that I've been in a family where there are no terrible feuds. I told them we were doing the book. They thought it was very funny. I don't think they took it very seriously, but then they don't take me very seriously. They don't find me to be a real person. He said that. So I think they think I'm, I'm a bit of a joke, which I am, and that my life is a bit of a joke. But which we never is. thought that. We were in awe and uh, uh, were so proud and uh, respectful of uh, him. That not wanting to infringe. Not, you know. not wanting to... Or to be in any way uh, sort of riding his coattails or, or you know, right. or trying to benefit from... Benefit from it. You all in all, it's quite difficult to value because it, it is an entirety. Um, to put separate values on it wouldn't work. No. I just think you're talking about at least £2,000 for the whole thing. Yes. Well, I, I've got a lot more um, sort of memorabilia Have of you? his at home. Well, yes. it could be more. How does one put a value on these things, these family treasures, this wealth of memory? Looking at these old photographs and thinking about Quentin has led me to question the complexity of our relationships with this complicated man. Throughout his life, Quentin felt outside of his family, at first because he was gay and then because he was famous. And there was a sense of propriety on both sides that kept us at a distance. In an article about his relationship to his family in the London Times, Quentin once wrote, I try not to be a burden. I am astonished at how detached I am. I have never thought about it, but I don't confide in anybody. I can't imagine starting a sentence with, I haven't told anyone this, but... I need people, but I don't need family or a specific person. I have distributed my love over the whole human race, and now it's threadbare. <laughs>